This time it's five British 1000cc motorcycles. The classic British industry is best known for producing lightweight, up to say medium capacity machines in the 350 to 500 cc bracket. Mostly single cylinder machines with the odd parallel twin thrown in for good measure. But there have been one litre monsters. Although in the early days these were usually big side valve monsters designed specifically for towing along a sidecar. But from time to time during the history we have produced the odd sporting one litre motorbike. So here are five really great examples. The Ariel Square 4. Ariel was one of the very earliest motorcycle manufacturers in Great Britain. They of course had earlier been a very early bicycle manufacturer too, and James Starley, the company's owner and founder, had patented the spoked wheel in the UK. The metal spoke wheel of course made the machine look like it was floating on air, hence the name Ariel. And throughout its history Ariel always prided itself on its trend towards innovation, perhaps no more so than the Square 4. But although Birmingham Company, the story of the Square 4 starts in London, with a motorcycle dealer called Edward Turner in 1928. He came up with the idea of a machine with two cylinders plus two behind in a square formation in 1928, believing this would provide a compact way of producing a four-cylinder motorcycle, rather than putting the thing across the frame where he believed it would be far too wide. Turner hawked the idea around various Midlands motorcycle companies, including BSA, all of which turned him down. Ariel, however, were different. They thought the idea had great potential, so he was given an area within the factory to develop his concept further. And at the 1930 Olympia show, the first 500cc model was unveiled. This used an overhead camshaft and utilised a four-speed, hand-change Berman gearbox. In 32, they enlarged the board by 5mm to produce a 601cc engine. This was done specifically to help out the riders of sidecars who would need that bit of extra torque. Now the early overhead cam versions had a bit of a reputation for overheating and blowing head gaskets. Although in truth this was somewhat exaggerated and was largely a result of aerial attempts to set a speed record on Brooklands with a blown version in 1932. The attempt failing because of overheating and lots of blown head gaskets. And so in 1936 the engine was completely redesigned so it now used overhead valves rather than an overhead cam and was enlarged up to 995ccs. A machine which in 1939 would gain the painted Ainsty plunger rear suspension system, as an option at least, and this system would remain with the bike until the end of its run. Following World War II, 1949 would see the reintroduction of the Square 4. This machine saw the introduction of an aluminium head and bowel, replacing the previous cast iron items. This would aid with cooling, but would also save 14 kilos or around 30 pounds in overall weight. Mark 1's engine produced around 35 horsepower at 5,500 rpm, giving a fairly modest top speed of just 90 miles an hour for a 1 litre motorcycle. It has to remember though this was running on pool petrol, so the octane was pretty awful. 1953 would see the introduction of the Mark 2. This bike is best known for those distinctive four pipes exiting the cylinder heads. The barrels were separate on this bike and again they were aluminium with iron liners to aid cooling. The redesign, and not forgetting the now much improved octane of fuel available, meant that the bike now produced 40 horsepower for a top speed of around 100 miles an hour. And the Mark II would be the last aerial square 4 to actually reach production. With those contra-rotating crankshafts, the engine was impressively smooth, making it a fantastic touring bike of the day. But the bike did have its Achilles heels. Firstly, trying to keep those big cylinder heads cool, especially the ones at the back, was very difficult. And then there was a problem trying to get the thing to breathe well. The bike had just a single carburetor and a rather tenuous airway tracks leading into each cylinder, so it was never going to be a high performance bike. And all that complexity just made the bike expensive. This was a real gentleman's conveyance, a great bike for touring, but not really at all sporty, and that's what the young guys wanted in the mid-50s. 
and in 1959 the Square 4 and indeed all aerials four strokes were killed off to make way for the aerial leader and arrow two strokes. The Coventry Eagle Flying 8. No prizes here for guessing where Coventry Eagle were actually manufactured. That's right, it was the Midland city of Coventry. The company had been founded by one John Meek in 1897, and by 1898 they had begun to experiment with motorised vehicles, and had their first motorcycle prototype running by as early as 1899. The company was primarily a bicycle manufacturer, so it lacked the facilities to actually cast its own engines. As a result, they used machines that were built around Villiers and JAP Jap engines in the period before the First World War. During the 1920s, the company would make use of whatever customer engines were available. These could range from Villiers, Jap, Sterney Archer, Blackburn or even Matchless. At the core of the company's business was always the lightweight machines based around those Villiers two-stroke engines. But at the top of the range during the 20s and 30s was the Flying Gate. The Flying Gate was essentially the equivalent to Bruff Superior's top of the range V twins. And for me, with that black and red paint scheme, the models are perhaps even more handsome. But Coventry Eagle lacked George Bruff's flair for publicity, and the machines were never as well known. And like the Bruff Superiors of the period, the Coventry Eagles used the Jap V twins, either in side valve or overhead valve form. Performance of the two bikes was very similar. The side valve reaching around 80 miles an hour and the overhead valve reaching 100 miles an hour, pretty much identical to the performance you would expect from a Bruff Superior of the period. Unfortunately, the global depression of the early 30s greatly affected Coventry Eagle, that one, so they really tailed back on the production of their larger good. bikes, concentrating almost exclusively on those small Villiers-powered two-strokes. But production of even these smaller machines began to slow during the 1930s, and by 1939 it had slowed to a crawl with production eventually stopping completely in the early part of 1940. The Vincent HRD Black Shadow The story of Vincent HRD begins in the 1920s with one Howard Raymond Davis, the HRD bit of the name. He was a, he was a motorcycle racer, an entrepreneur, setting up his own motorcycle manufacturing business in the 1920s after previously racing for other people. He used his own motorcycle to win the TT and would be the first and only person to ever do this on a motorcycle of his own manufacture. However, times were hard and in 1928 HRD would go bankrupt. The company was bought up by one Phil Vincent. He bought the existing manufacturing name of HRD and initially named his machines Vincent HRD to give them a little bit of cachet value. The early Vincent HRDs would use customer engines such as Japs fitted into their own frame. But pretty soon the company's head engineer, one Phil Irvin, would design a single cylinder engine of their very own. The story goes that in 1933, while developing his new single cylinder motor, Irvin realised that if he laid the two engines across each other, apparently had two blueprints laying over each other, this may or may not be a true story, he realised that he could create a V-twin. And so Vincent's first 1000cc V-twin, the Series A, was introduced in the late 30s. This machine is sometimes called the plumber's nightmare, because there are just oil pipes all over the place. It's one of Tom's favourite bikes of all time, he just loves the way the thing looks. But the Mark 1 was not without its flaws, and in fact only a very small number were ever actually completed, making it one of the rarest motorcycles in the world. In 37, Phil Irvin left to go and work for Velocet. However, in 1943 he was back and began work on a much improved version of the V-Twin. And this would be the series B Rapide. This saw the angle of the V-Twin opened out to 50 degrees. The engine being essentially a ground up redesign, which fixed a lot of the problems from the earlier bike. However, the poor quality of fuel of the period meant that the machine's power was actually only slightly improved over the 45 horsepower of the Series A. But the engine was much more accomplished and was used as a stress member in the all new frame. 
a frame which now employed cantilever rear suspension, although slightly incongruously still retained girder forks. The Series C arrived in 48 and now had the girdrolic front forks. This was again a girder fork, but it now employed hydraulic damping. Vincent preferred the girders because he felt they were less prone to flexion during competition than the telescopic forks of the time. The engine in the Series C was available in two states of tune. The Rapide made 45 horsepower, whereas the Black Shadow made 54 horsepower at 5,700 rpm. And this was enough for top speed in the 125 mile an hour bracket. Now there will be those old boys that tell you that Vincent's produced 70 horsepower. This is technically true for the Black Lightning, but this was a racing version of the engine that definitely did not run on the pool petrol available at the time. The octane of the gasoline available was simply not up to the job of kicking out that much power. The Series D which followed were the final big V-twins produced by Vincent. They had fully enclosed bodywork, but this proved extremely unpopular, and Vincent had to reluctantly sell the machines in naked form too. But the writing was on the wall for Vincent, they were too big, expensive and glamorous in what was a very austere period for Great Britain, and in 1955, the final Vincent V-Twins would roll off the production line. Rough Superior SS80 and SS100 George Brough was an engineer who worked at Rough Motorcycles, his father's concern. However, in 1919 he struck out on his own and established the Brough Superior Motorcycle Manufacturing Company in Nottingham. George was a keen racer, so he developed his V-twin machines very much with competition in mind. It has to remember that V-twins at this period were mostly seen as sidecar tugs and not at all as sporting bikes. But throughout the 1920s, George Brough could be seen racing his motorcycles around the tracks at Brooklands and at various other places in the British Isles. But perhaps the machines are best known as the preferred mount of one T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, who would meet his death on one of the machines in 1935. An accomplished writer, Lawrence would write poetically about his experiences riding his buff superiors, of which he owned eight in total. Of which his final machine, George VIII, was still in construction when Buff was tragically killed riding George VII. With their nickel tanks and massive V-twin engines, the Bruffs are perhaps one of the most desirable motorcycles ever built, and command some of the highest prices too. But in fact, despite their fame and notoriety, only 3,048 machines were actually completed by the factory in some 21 years of production, of which about 75% are still known to be in existence, an absolutely amazing survival rate. Like Coventry Eagle, Bruff would be best known for their use of J8 Presswick or Jap engines, of side valve or overhead valve variety. But in point of fact, near the end of production, George Bruff was somewhat dissatisfied with the supply of engines coming from J8 Presswick. So in the end he would switch engines to ones supplied by Matchless. And in fact it's the Matchless engine which graces the very last of Bruff Superior's SS100 models. Production ending in 1940. The Triumph Daytona 1000. The Triumph Daytona 1000 is somewhat unique in this list, being the only bike of the bunch with a transversely mounted four cylinder engine. But the story of this machine dates back to 1983 and the collapse of Meriden. Builder John Bloor swept in, purchased the factory, demolished it and built houses on top of it, so not a promising start. But he did go on to build a completely new factory in Hinckley in Leicestershire. Work on the new family of engines began in 1985 in secret, and by 87 they had an engine up and running. Bloor constructed the new factory in Hinckley in 1988, from which in 1991 the first of the new generation Triumphs would emerge. And these new machines were based around a modular concept. It was a high tensile steel backbone frame which was used universally across the whole model range. And there was a range of engines with three and four cylinders, which was then subdivided into long and short stroke engines. The Daytona 1000 used the short stroke version of the four cylinder motor, and there was a short stroke three cylinder engine used to make the 750 Daytona. 
The Daytona used a four-cylinder liquid-cooled direct overhead cam four-stroke engine with a boring stroke of 76 by 55. The bike ran four valve cylinder heads and had a compression ratio of around 11 to 1. Peak horsepower was 120 at 10,500 rpm, enough for around 150 miles an hour top speed. But spine frame design made the bike feel rather top heavy and she was overweight and perhaps a little bit underpowered compared to the other Lita sports bikes at the time. As a result, less than 500 units would ultimately be sold before a long stroke 1200cc version replaced it in 1993. What other collections of bikes would you like to see us do a video on? Or maybe you've got a bike we can use with a test ride? Either way, drop us a line below. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, thank you very much for watching.